<laughs> Acts chapter 8, and I'll begin reading at verse 1. Now Saul, this is Saul of Tarsus, was consenting to his death. Whose death was that? Well, in fact, let's just go back to chapter 7, and I'll read beginning at verse 58. Stephen, one of the outstanding young Christian men at the time, had been preaching about Jesus Christ, and there was a hostile audience. They really did not care at all for what he was saying. So, And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Same one. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he, Stephen, knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Stephen, in his dying words, was obeying one of the Beatitudes of Jesus Christ. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, said, Pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. And here Stephen was praying the greatest possible prayer for these people that were stoning him. Lord, don't lay this sin. Don't blame them for this sin, in other words. Wow, what a prayer. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. All right, getting back to Acts 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great, great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all, that is the Christians, scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. They stayed in Jerusalem, most likely in hiding for a time. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. After all, his loss was a big loss for the church. In Acts chapter 6, he was selected as one of the seven men who would help make sure that all the widows, Christian widows in Jerusalem, were taken care of. In fact, it describes him as being full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Some have described him as a cut above the best of the Christians in Jerusalem. So his loss hurt. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. That word means mayhem. Entering every house. So as Christians were scattering, getting away from Jerusalem, there were some who were, might have been delayed for one reason or another, especially those who had children to look after. Well, he entered every house to try to determine if there were Christians there. And dragging, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison, committing them meant that he was, wasn't just putting them in prison for overnight or a weekend. No, this was for an indefinite period. For some of them, all of their lives. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere. Doing what? Hiding? Laying low? Cowering? No. Preaching the word, the very thing that caused the persecution in the first place. Then Philip, also one of these elite Christians, as we might say, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And he had no idea whether they would accept or reject the message. But that was not his duty. His duty was to preach, which he did. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out, and many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Great joy. And no wonder. For those people, <coughs> salvation, heaven, was not a fantasy. It was not a pipe dream. It was a reality for those who obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those people were now children of God. 1 John 3, verse 1. Their lives were changed forever. All because 
those who are scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And they kept preaching. They didn't stop there. In Acts 12, 24, the word of God grew and multiplied. Acts 19, 20, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. In light of all that, I've been asking a question. What is the difference between those Christians, early Christians, and us today? I mean, don't we want the gospel to be spread? Don't we want the lost to be saved? Absolutely, we want that. As proof of that, so many of you invited people to come last Sunday where the gospel was preached. I was telling Jim Romans before the service, I'm still amazed at the attendance last Sunday morning especially after just looking around at some of the area congregations, as I mentioned this morning, the church in Dexter, a wonderful congregation, but struggling, struggling, with an average attendance only of about 30 right now, probably about a third of what they were post or pre-COVID, I'm sorry. So you invited people, so many of you, you're interested in the law. The fact that we're supporting missions, the fact that we're sending money, as Corey talked about, to disaster relief, Churches of Christ disaster relief effort is not just to help people materially. It's to help people spiritually and take time and share the gospel and pray with those people. So what is the difference between those early Christians and us? I would put it down to this. We are not as personally active in sharing the gospel ourselves. I'm not saying we're not at all. I just don't think for the most part we are as personally active. So what, if that's true, let's just give me the benefit of the doubt. If that is true, what made them more personally active than we today? I've talked about three reasons. Number one, they considered the Great Commission as a personal direct order from Jesus Christ, their commander-in-chief. And it is. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That was meant for all Christians, Mark 16, 15. Number two, I said for the most part, those early Christians were very poor. They didn't have many distractions. They they were weighed down by, by possessions that they had to care for and maintain and ensure and protect and all those things that we spend more time maybe than we want to admit with. And number three, as we talked about last Sunday night, they prayed for something that we don't pray for as often, I don't think, at least for me, as we should. They pray for boldness. Acts 4, 23 through 31, I won't reread it. But right during the midst of persecution, they prayed not for rescue, not for deliverance, not for a way of escape. They prayed for boldness, to keep preaching. And they did. Reminds me of the story of the, the young Christian man that lacked the courage to kiss his girlfriend. He'd taken her out several times. He still hadn't kissed her. And he just, he he confided in a Christian friend. He said, I don't know what to do. She wants me to kiss her. I haven't kissed her yet. So the friend said, are you taking her out tonight? He said, yes, I am. The friend said, tell you what, just before you take her out, you pray for boldness. And apparently he did because he showed up the next day with a black eye. (laughs) So, yeah. Be careful what you pray about. All right, so tonight I'm going to complete this series about winning the lost, sharing the gospel of the lost with two additional differences between them and us. And I'm not talking about differences between all of them and all of us, but for some. Number four, the early Christians, many of them, focus more on heaven, going to heaven than anything else. And it's not that we don't, but I think they did more. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand why. As I mentioned, time and time again, they were so poor. They had little to occupy their time and attention. And listen to me, they had little here on earth to look at and say, I really enjoy this or that in terms of any material possession. They just didn't have them. Now, that being the case, when many of those early Christians heard more about heaven 
And again, they didn't have much here to enjoy, but they heard about heaven and its glory and beauty, Revelation 21, and its mansions, John 14, 2, and its treasures, Matthew 19, 21, and the crowns will be given there, James 1, 12, and the streets of gold, Revelation 21, 21, and no pain and no sorrow, no death, Revelation 21, verse 4. Many of those early Christians could hardly think of anything else but heaven, because they didn't have anything here really to enjoy. So they look forward to something they could enjoy and enjoy forever. Now you say, all right. But what does that have to do with them sharing the gospel? Let's look quickly. Now I have to read this quickly at an Old Testament story that I think reveals the answer. I'm reading from the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 7. And I'll begin at verse 1. And you can read as I go, or you can just listen carefully. At this point in time, the Syrian army, enemies of Israel, had surrounded the Jewish city, the northern capital of Samaria. They had cut off the supplies. The people were starving. So they got to the point where they were selling any, anything edible for outrageous prices. Some people actually collected the droppings of, of doves and sold a few drops for $5 in our money today. Well, God had decided, and all this happened because of the disobedience, but God decided they'd learn their lesson, so he decided to rescue them. So I'm reading again, 2 Kings 7. Then Elisha, the prophet, said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, a Asiya is about nine quarts. A fine flower shall be sold for a shekel. That's about a dollar. And two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. If you want to reckon that in our time, that would be like selling three loaves of bread or four loaves of bread for one dollar. A real bargain, okay? So an officer on, on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, I mean, where things, blessings just dropped out, could this thing be? In other words, that's outrageous. It'll never happen. And he, Elisha, said, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And he wouldn't eat of it because, and we won't go all the way down to verse 17, because he would be trampled to death as hordes of Jews from Samaria ran out of the city to gather all the food, all the supplies, to make them relatively wealthy and to make food very, very inexpensive. All right, we continue in verse 3. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here till we die? If we say we will enter the city, go back in, the famine is, the, is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live, because they knew they had plenty of food in their camp. And if they kill us, we'll only die. We won't be any worse off. You know, that's just something to remember as Christians. If this world kills us, and we're going to die anyway, that's the worst this world can do. Okay? And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians, and when they'd come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army, so they said to one another, look, the king, they're just figuring, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore, they arose and fled at twilight. They felt they were outnumbered from the sounds God made them hear and left the camp intact. They didn't take anything. Their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and fled for their lives. As that expression I love, they, they ran for the hill. 
And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent. Nobody there. It's full of food and valuables. And ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Oh, they're thinking, oh, we're wealthy now. And they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Then, then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This is a day of good news. And we remain silent? If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell Go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, We went to the Syrian camp, and surprisingly no one was there. Not a human or sound, only horses and donkeys tied in the tents and tacked. And the gatekeepers called out, and they told it to the king's household inside, and we'll stop there. Folks, many of those early Christians felt the same way about salvation. How can we sit on this? How can you hoard heaven? So they wanted everybody to have a chance for it. I mean, their spouses, certainly, and their parents, and siblings, and children, and friends, and associates, and strangers. Everyone deserves a shot, as we would say this thing. Paul said in Romans 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they may be saved. The Apostle Paul only knew a relative few in Israel. The vast majority were strangers, but he wanted every single one to have the opportunity to be saved. And he talks about that in detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 19. He said, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And I won't read all of that, but down in verse 22, he says, I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. They deserve this. And folks, don't misunderstand. I'm not suggesting that we don't want others saved. But listen, if we, like many of those early Christians, would think of little else but heaven, If heaven occupied our thinking most of our waking hours, I'm convinced we would have a greater desire to talk to others about it. You know, Corey mentioned something, you know, about the hurricane. Let me take it a step farther. If you and I were to lose everything tonight, in every possession, even our homes, but without any possibility of regaining it, Would we not think more about what's to come? Would we not think, you know, I'm I'm, I'm upset I lost this. I'm sad in a way, but you know what? I've got something. I think we would think more of heaven. And we would therefore talk more to others about heaven. When Jesus talked about how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 19, 23. One of the reasons for that, because those who are rich and in the sight of Jesus at that point, many of us would qualify, they just don't think about heaven as much. But let me give you one other reason, one other difference. Many of those early Christians just could not stand the thought of, weep, or, I'm sorry, lost souls, weeping and agonizing and burning in the lake of fire. Oh, they knew all about the warnings of Jesus and the apostles. Such as what Jesus said, predicting the judgment scene. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left hand, the lost, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. They understood what Paul had warned the Thessalonians about. 2 Thessalonians 1, beginning with verse 8. Jesus, when he returns, will do so in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. These shall be punished 
with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day. They understood what John would write about in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. In fact, Revelation 14 verse 11 says the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. And knowing that, these early Christians were willing to do anything possible to keep others out of that hell. Paul said it this way, I am debtor, Romans 1.14, I am debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. Paul, what debt did you owe them to try to keep them out of hell? How can I be on my way to heaven, avoiding hell, and just let others slide? He said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16, he says, necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe to me to just say, oh, I don't know those people. Sorry. Woe to me. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, he says, knowing therefore the terror, the terror of the Lord, being banished at the judgment. We persuade men. One more word about our possessions. They may not only distract us from thinking about heaven as much as we should, maybe they distract us from thinking about the horrors of hell and how bad it will be for those who go. Solomon in Proverbs 11 and verse 30 said, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. There's a lot of people in this area who, if you ask them, are you saved, are you a Christian, where do you go to church, would not even be interested in talking to you about the subject. They just look at you as any other solicitor. But I want you to know there are searching souls. And there are hurting souls around us. They deserve a chance to at least hear. May God help us to give them that chance. Let's all pray. Oh, Father, thank you for... Whoever, however, each one of us here who is a Christian heard the gospel. Thank you for those or the person who shared it with us. Thank you for giving us enough time in our lives that we obeyed the gospel. And are on our way to that wonderful place called heaven. And no matter what happens, no matter how short or long our life is, we have that. Because of Jesus. So, help us to be more like, to feel more like those early Christians. To take Jesus' great commission as his personal order for us. To focus more on the lost than what we have in our homes or yards or property. To pray for boldness. To spend more time thinking about heaven and not here. And remember how bad hell will be and how little those who are heading there even know about hell. Please help us do something about that. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for everything. And for the chance, in fact, the promise of salvation through him. And it's through his name that we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. And if there's anyone who's needs to respond to the gospel tonight to be baptized into Christ. If you believe in him and are willing to change, repent, 
confess Him, we'll be happy to baptize you. If you need our prayers tonight, we'd be happy to pray for you. All you have to do is let us know. And if you're willing to do that and need to, we'd ask you to come up and have a seat up front, anywhere up here, as we now all stand and sing the song of invitation.